I now give the floor to Her Excellency Annalena Baerbock, Federal Minister for Foreign Affairs of Germany. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we live in a world of quick headlines and even quicker slogans. Take back control. My country first. Us against them. Slogans that paint the world in black and white. Slogans that want to make us believe things are very simple. That there's only one side that matters. Us against them. I come from a country where this logic, us against them, was taken to the worst extremes that humankind has ever seen. A murderous world war that killed millions. And the worst imaginable crime against humanity, the Shoah, the genocide of six million Jews dehumanized, murdered, just for being Jews. Murdered because of a Nazi ideology that would only accept the humanity of those they defined as Germans. After World War II, this institution here in New York was founded on the understanding that us against them leads to disasters. That the world needs a counter model, our UN Charter. A counter model to a world in which we only accept the humanity of ourselves, but not of others. A counter model that instead grants every country in the world the right to determine its own destiny that cast a positive vision of our shared future. A vision of an international order that is based on rules, on the equality of every state and every human being, of cooperation instead of divisive nationalism, of a humanity that is indivisible. And these are not simple slogans. These are the principles we try to live up every day. Yet, living up to them is anything but simple. It demands hard work, maybe more than ever before. It needs empathy and solidarity, the opposite of my country first. It demands the will to put ourselves in the shoes of the other. It demands, especially in times of crises, the strength to recognize the other's pain, even if our own pain seems unbearable, and to find common ground despite all the things that divide us. It also means that we have to face the dilemma that the values of the Charter can at times appear to contradict each other, such as the inherent right to self-defense and the responsibility to protect civilians when the civilians are misused as human shields. Resolving this is harder than simply exclaiming either or, us against them especially in our days of social media, where simple TikTok truths seem to blur out all complexity and nuance, sometimes even facts. As we see regarding the war in the Middle East, in its ruthless attack of October 7th last year, Hamas maimed and killed some 1,200 men women, 
and children. To this day, the terrorists are holding more than 100 people, men, women, children, hostage, including German citizens, including children. At the same time, in Gaza, hungry, traumatized children are wandering the ruins of what used to be their homes, desperately searching for their parents under the rubble. Seeing all this with burning hearts, I guess it might be human that sometimes we are all tempted to fall emotionally for simple slogans, to only see one side when our hearts are burning. In addition, each of us is looking at this conflict from our own perspective and history. We need to respect that. But we must not stop there. Instead, we need to ask ourselves, what if this was me? If these were my children? In competition of pain, there can be no winners. This is how one of the hostage families put it. Humanity is universal. If in the darkest hour of her life, the mother of a murdered hostage finds the strength to see both sides, then we, as leaders of the countries around the world, who have the privilege to speak in this hall, should be capable of doing the same. Not to fall for quick slogans, but to rally around humanity in order to overcome this vicious circle of hate. Universal humanity means the rights of Israelis and Palestinians do not cancel each other out. And this is why my country stands by its commitment to the security of the State of Israel. And why at the same time, we are working every day to end the hell for the children of Gaza. Because lasting security for Israelis will only be possible if there's lasting security for Palestinians. And the opposite is also true. Lasting security for Palestinians will only be possible if there's lasting security for Israelis. This is why we are not resting until the hostages are home. This is why we are working so hard for a ceasefire, the Biden plan which was endorsed by the Security Council. Why at the same time, together with our partners, we are working hard to get more humanitarian aid into Gaza. This is why I've been in the region 11 times since October. Germany alone has provided more than 360 million euro for humanitarian aid for Gaza, for the Palestinian families in Gaza since last October. And this is also why yesterday we came together with a group of countries to call for an immediately 21-day ceasefire along the Blue Line. Because a broader regional escalation would not bring anyone long-lasting security. And as, frankly speaking, sometimes frustrating, the lack of progress is and hurting. We are not giving up on seeking a political vision for Israelis and Palestinians to be able to live peacefully side by side in two states. For me, resignation is simply not an option because that would mean that the playbook of terrorism and extremism carries the day. We need to recognize each other's pain, each other's interests, 
and yes, also listen openly to each other's complaints if we want to move forward. And if we do so, we might sometimes hear things we don't want to hear, our own shortcomings. Frankly, I remember how I called two and a half years ago so many colleagues here in the room and around the world to ask for your support in standing up against Russia's imperial war in Ukraine. And how one of my colleagues said, but where were you when we needed you, when we were attacked by the Houthis? And others said, you didn't stand with us in our anti-colonial struggle. And yes, that gave me a pause, because they had a point. And I firmly believe critical self-reflection of what we, or generations before us in our countries, have done wrong is actually to our benefit. Because the ability to learn from past mistakes makes societies stronger. And it is the only way to build a better future. That is why my country, Germany, has started to address our colonial past more thoroughly. The restitution of artifacts is a crucial element here. That is also why we are in the midst of an important reconciliation process with Namibia. Because we can't undo mistakes of the past. But we can unite for a better future. And we can choose that every day by our own action. Facing our colonial history, to me, means doing the right thing today. But it also means that we have to stand up to the imperialist atrocities we are witnessing in our days today. Russia does not have a better future in mind for Ukraine. Ukraine is an independent state that gave up its nuclear arsenal in the 1990s because it believed in the principles and guarantees of this charter. And in its bodies, like the Security Council, three decades later, it is attacked by a P5 country. One of the countries that bears, as the Charter says, the primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. Russia's war against Ukraine has destroying Ukrainian cities, schools, and hospitals for almost 1,000 days now. And it's ravaging the security order of my continent, Europe. Its ripple effects have been felt for so many here around the world. Many of you are feeling in your own countries the consequences in food prices and other things. And that is why I understand that some of you are asking, like in the Security Council two days ago, wouldn't the war be over if you Europeans just stopped providing Ukraine with weapons? There's nothing wrong with asking that, because we all wish for peace. But the idea that if there were no defensive weapons, there would be no fighting and no dying in Ukraine is as simple as it is wrong. We have seen that, and we have seen what happened in June when Ukraine invited Russia to an international peace summit. Instead of stopping his attack and coming to the negotiation table, Putin sent his response by bombing a children's hospital. As long as Putin is not willing to come to the negotiation table, stopping our support for self-defense would simply mean leaving Ukraine's children's hospitals defenseless. 
It would mean more war crimes, not less. Possibly in other countries too. Time and again within the last months, Putin's Russia has been toying with the invulnerability of the borders of the Baltic states and Poland. Two weeks ago, it fired a missile against a civilian grain ship in Romanian territorial waters. This is why today I'm also asking your support. Your support in calling out on Putin to cease his attacks and to come to the negotiation table. Not only for our European security, but I think also in your own interest. If a permanent member of the Security Council is allowed to conquer and destroy its smaller neighbor, the very essence of this charter is under attack. If Russia stops attacking, the war is over. If Ukraine stops defending itself, Ukraine is over. And our charter. Sovereign equality, Article 2, Paragraph 1. Peaceful settlement of disputes, Article 2, Paragraph 3. The prohibition of the use of force, Article 2, Paragraph 4. And this is why we will continue to stand firmly with Ukraine and our charter. To achieve a peace that is just and lasting, with security guarantees, a peace that secures Ukraine's existence as a free and independent country. A peace that ensures Ukraine's and Europe's security. And by that, the security of all of us. Obviously, none of this is easy. For almost 1,000 days now, so many countries have been working for Ukrainian children to sleep in their beds again and not in air raid shelters. For almost a year, so many of us have been working to help end the suffering in the Middle East. In countless talks in the region, countless meetings in our UN bodies. And yes, sometimes I too feel like giving in to despair. But throwing up our hands in resignation, again, is not an option. Because then the logic of us against them takes over. And also, and this is important to me, we tend to forget one thing in these times of crisis. There is a lot we can and have already achieved as an international community every day, if we stand together, if we take each other's perspectives. To name only two striking latest examples, think about what we have achieved at the COP in Dubai only a year ago. When we saw what is possible when we overcome the us versus them, the industrial states against G77, the South versus the North, when we listened Instead, first of all, to those most affected by the climate crisis, to our SIT partners, who have been telling us for decades that the climate crisis is threatening their very existence and is the biggest security threat in the whole world. When with more than 190 states, we finally agreed to signal the end of the fossil era at COP28, and we set up a loss and damage fund for the most vulnerable because it's just and fair. And we saw again what we can achieve just earlier this week when we passed here the pact of the future, of our future. It took tough negotiations, hundreds of hours of text works in conference rooms, overnight sessions, last minute compromises for over two years. And many helped and didn't resign. Many helped along with us and partners, 
and from Namibia and so many others. But in the end, the vast majority of us found the strength to rally around what unites us, rules instead of brute nationalism, cooperation instead of division, a humanity that is universal. And it is in this spirit that Germany is running for a non-permanent seat on the Security Council for 27-28. We are running as defenders of the Charter, of our shared principles. And that means that we also need to take a critical look at the status quo of multilateral institutions. Because in many ways, our multilateral system still reflects a time when hardly any of us here in the room had been born. When the striking number of 142 states represented in this hall today were not sitting at the table. That needs to change. And that's why we are working for a reform of the Security Council, so that it better reflects the world we actually live in. That has a better representation of African countries. And yes, it is also totally unjust that at the two most important international financial institutions, there are only Europeans and Americans at the top. We need our institutions to be accepted by all of us. And for that, they need to represent all of us. And all of us, that is, not just men of the world. The one thing we definitely all have in common is this. Women make up at least 50% of every single country. But in 80 years of this organization, there has never been a female secretary general. So if this organization calls for equality and justice in the world, it is long overdue for us to show it here in New York. So we probably all should already practice to say the words, Madam Secretary General, the floor is yours. Because the next Secretary General of the United Nations has to be a woman. Obviously, that alone will not immediately end all the remaining inequality for women in our own countries. In this General Assembly, we hail from all regions of the world. But none of us has reached full gender equality. And I think we can only achieve it together by learning from each other and by speaking up for women's rights, not only in our own countries, but everywhere. Because women's rights are human rights. And nothing northern, western, eastern, or southern. They are universal. And none of us wants to be paid less than her male colleague for the same job. None of us wants to be raped. None of us wants to be arrested for showing our hair. No woman, and I would guess no men either. Because a life is a life, a Palestinian woman's life is a life, an Israeli man's life is a life. A Sudanese girl's life is a life. A Ukrainian boy's life is a life. Almost 80 years ago, the UN was founded for exactly that. On the realization that simple slogans, that us versus them, leads to the disaster. That humanity is in divisible. Thank you. I thank Her Excellency Annalena Baerbock, Federal Minister for Foreign Affairs of Germany.